Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Great Hall of the Justice Department, again for the second in our series of the Jackson Nash Address. It's a special opportunity for us all to be able to get together in this historic room with lawyers, economists from the Antitrust Division, former colleagues and members of the Antitrust Bar to celebrate Justice Robert Jackson and Professor John Nash. We're also fortunate to have several members of the uh, Justice Robert H. Jackson family present with us today. We're grateful you were able to take the time. It's a special day today. I'll explain why in just a second. Uh, grandchildren, uh, Mr. Tom Loftus, his wife Phyllis, uh, Julia, Craig Hill, and uh, the current Justice Melissa Jackson in the New York Supreme Court uh, was unfortunately not able to come because of a matter she has before her, but uh, we're grateful for, the, for you guys to be here with us today. Uh, it is, I should also note, this is exactly the Great Hall where Justice Jackson gave one of his greatest addresses in 1940. Uh, this was the second gathering of the U.S. attorneys and a very, I think, a timeless speech that he gave that Justice Scalia uh, cited in, his, in one of his dissents. And um, we're back in, in this uh, great hall for that this afternoon. We have a number of special guests and speakers that I'd like to recognize. Faced, uh, first of all, we are honored to be joined today by our Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein. Of particular relevance today, Rod, I learned through my time here, shares my deep admiration for Robert Jackson. So much so that he selected the, uh, this extraordinary portrait of Robert Jackson to hang in his conference room on the fourth floor of this building. He generously loaned this to us for this event today. Thank you for that. And some of you may know, every attorney general has a portrait that hangs somewhere in this building. To be frank, some are good, some are better than the others. Robert Jackson's is unquestionably, in my view, one of the best. It's a powerful image of a prosecutor, an advocate, and a judge. It shows him as he was, a true giant of American history, and I find it inspiring because I believe it captures something about the man. Thanks again, Rod, for uh, lending us this great portrait. Also with us, I'd like to recognize our colleague, United States Solicitor General, Noel Francisco. It's especially fitting that you're here because one of the many positions that the great Robert Jackson held during his distinguished service at the Justice Department was that of the Solicitor General. Those are big shoes to fill, but you're doing a great job. And indeed, another great former Solicitor General, uh, Judge Ken Starr, recently noted that Noel, quote, turned in a truly epic performance in the Supreme Court this last term. It's well-deserved praise, and I thank you for making the time to be with us uh, today, Noel. In a moment, uh, the Deputy Attorney General will introduce our initial speaker. And this is why it's special today, because we have Professor John Barrett of St. John's University School of Law in New York. Uh, he is the foremost Robert Jackson scholar, and he'll provide some important historical context to put Justice Jackson's time as head of the Antitrust Division in perspective, and why we have named uh, this award where we bring Nobel laureates in economics uh, after Justice Jackson and John Nash. After Professor Barrett, Dr. Jeff Wilder will then introduce Professor George Akerlof. Jeff has served as a PhD economist at the Antitrust Division for over 15 years. He's a leader of the economic regulatory section of the division's economic analysis group. Many of you know of Professor Akerlof. He won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2001 for his analysis of markets with asymmetric information. Today, Professor Akerlof will discuss the subject of his recent book, Fishing for Fools. Both of those are with the PH, Fishing and Fools. The Economics of Manipulation and Deception, which argues that markets can harm as well as help. Of course, Professor Akerlof is not what you might call, quote, antitrust economist, but that's the whole point of the Jackson-Nash Address, 
is for us to think outside the box and to feature the work of world-renowned thinkers who are at the cutting edge of theory and empirical analysis in the field of economics more broadly. Our hope is that inviting brilliant economists like Professor Akerlof from outside the traditional realm of antitrust economics will stimulate our minds, encourage creativity, and fuel innovative thinking in the broader antitrust law and economics communities, especially as antitrust continues to get challenged with the advent of new markets and new technologies. With that, I'd like to welcome the Deputy Attorney General to the lecture to present uh, Professor Barrett. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is really unfair because they told me I have three minutes and I cannot possibly talk about Robert Jackson in three minutes or less, let alone do that and introduce John Barrett. So I'm going to stretch it maybe to four or five. Uh, but I want to tell you that my interest in uh, Robert Jackson did not begin when I took this job because for federal prosecutors, uh, Jackson is an icon. He didn't spend that long as Attorney General. Ja uh, John will tell us a little more about his experience. But uh, he gave some really remarkable speeches. Uh, and one of them, which is the one Megan adverted to, is about the role of the federal prosecutor. It was April 1st of 1940 here in this room. And every time I speak in this room, I mention that Robert Jackson was standing right in about this spot on April 1st of 1940 when he delivered this speech that is really timeless. You know, here we are now. Uh, 78 or so years later, uh, and I think another 100 years from now, prosecutors will still be quoting from Robert Jackson. Uh, I, I should tell you, though, that uh, one of the perks of being Deputy Attorney General is you get to pick which portraits you want in the Deputies Conference Room, as I refer to it. It's not mine. It's the Deputy Attorney General's Conference Room. And when I arrived, the Jackson portrait was in Noel's office. <laughs> but Noel wasn't here yet. And so that was the number one on my list. And people ask, do you pick the portraits because uh, of the significance of the person or because of the, you know, the beauty of the portrait? In this case, as Macon mentioned, it's really both. It's a beautiful portrait. Uh, 75 or so years since it was painted, uh, you know, it really is one of the most attractive portraits. But also you know, one of the more significant people, uh, not just because of his time as Supreme Court Justice, his family members know him as Justice Jackson. I always refer him as Attorney General because that's always the most relevant to my remarks. And uh, one of the things that uh, it reminds me of when I see the portrait is Jackson is quite properly regarded as one of the great Attorneys General in American history, but his tenure here was not smooth. And I have the advantage, having been here for 30 years almost, of being able to remind the younger people that although it seems like there's a lot of furor about the Department of Justice, it's always that way, and I'd much rather have the job today than in Jackson's day. You know, he was dealing with World War. That's a lot more significant than anything I've had to deal with. But he also had to deal with challenges with the Congress. That's nothing new either. And I came across a speech that uh, Jackson had delivered that had some lines that I wanted to use, and I didn't know the historical context. And so I reached out to John Barrett, who I know because he and I crossed paths here at the department uh, about 25 years ago. And John uh, told me the historical context, which, again, I don't have time. I've already exceeded my three minutes. Uh, but, but it was so uh, valuable to me you know, to understand what sort of challenges he faced uh, and how he resolved them, faithful to the principles of the Department of Justice. That's really what, when we talk about Robert Jackson, that's what it means to us, is that he so effectively articulated and represented the principles of the Department of Justice. Uh, and so I'm very grateful. Uh, John, to you for all that you do to carry on uh, the Jackson legacy and Jackson scholarship. Uh, today, uh, coincidentally, Attorney General John Ashcroft was here, uh, who also is one of my heroes. I worked for him uh, on 9-11, another period when you wouldn't have wanted the job uh, because of how challenging it was. Uh, and he came to visit my office. I uh, actually wasn't there. Noel was with him. He came to visit my office. He noticed there was an empty spot on the wall and they explained to him that the Jackson portrait had been borrowed. And he was a little bit troubled by that. But here's the thing, Macon. You checked it out at noon. It has to be back by 5. <laughs> and, and we're going to hold you accountable. Um, so the primary purpose, though, of my brief presentation is to introduce our uh, next speaker, John Barrett. Those of you who are fans of Robert Jackson, you know him well. John studied at Georgetown University, earned a law degree at Harvard, 
He's a professor of law at St. John's University in New York. He's the Elizabeth Lena Fellow and board member at the Robert Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York, and he is the author uh, and uh, promulgator of what he calls the Jackson List, which is an email directory. If you're not on it, you should get on it because he puts out historical tidbits from time to time uh, about Robert Jackson and really keeps together this large community of people you know, who continue to be inspired by Justice Jackson's legacy. Prior to entering academia, John worked for the Independent Counsel, Lawrence Walsh, on the Iran-Contra matter, and here at the Department of Justice, where he worked in the Office of Inspector General. Today, John will focus on Robert Jackson's tenure as Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division from 1937 to 1938. Last job I had, uh, uh, or a job I had earlier in the department was uh, in the Tax Division, which is another place that Robert Jackson was the Assistant Attorney General, and it's really remarkable in such a brief period of time he held four or five Senate-confirmed positions. John will tell you the right number here in the department. Um, in those days, you could actually get confirmed for those jobs pretty quick. <laughs> you could never hold that many jobs in just a few years uh, these days. But uh, in any event, as I said, it's such an honor here. I thank Megan for naming this lecture in honor of Justice Jackson for keeping this legacy going. And we're very grateful to have, uh, uh, as our introductory speaker, John Barrett. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Attorney General. The power of a place is often palpable long beyond any particular moment. For the rest of my life, when I walk on the campus of Princeton University, I'll recall a moment when the person next to me many years ago pointed to an approaching figure and said, do you know who that is? And I looked at an elderly man approaching not disheveled and not troubled, but looking very academic, and said no. And I was told, that's John Nash. I also feel the power of the place in this room because, of course, as Rod Rosenstein mentioned, Robert Jackson, as Attorney General, delivered from approximately this spot one of the greatest ethical, principled, far-sighted addresses in the history of American law called the Federal Prosecutor about the ethical way to undertake the job that he and his audience of United States attorneys were engaged in in 1940. I'm very grateful to the Deputy Attorney General, to the Assistant Attorney General, to the Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Antitrust Division, Roger Alford, my old friend, to all of their colleagues, to the division, to Dr. Akerloff, and to John Nash and Robert Jackson for the honor of being here this afternoon. I will address three topics. Briefly, Jackson's life, and then Jackson's year as the Assistant Attorney General heading the Antitrust Division, and then Jackson on Antitrust. Jackson's life is an American story that is, frankly, spectacular. In only 62 years, he traveled from his birth on a farm in Northwest Pennsylvania, in Warren County, in Spring Creek Township in 1892, to local, state, national and international prominence and perpetual significance. His family had prosperity of an individualist autonomous type but no wealth and had farmed across the 19th century. Early in the 20th century, Jackson's father moved the family north across the New York state line and he went to school in Frewsburg, New York, which is basically an intersection today as it was in those days with an excellent ice cream stand. Uh, and after graduating as the valedictorian from the Frewsburg High School in 1909, Robert Jackson commuted up the valley to Jamestown, New York for an additional year of high school as a postgraduate second time senior with a much stronger faculty, some people with college degrees, and in effect a tutorial program. And that's where he got literature and writing and oration and economics and history. And that's where his general higher education ended. You see, at age 18, he earned a second high school diploma and then did not go on to college or university. Instead, he began to apprentice for a two-man law office, a perfect pair. One was a trial lawyer, a talker, a politico. One was a writer, an appellate lawyer, cerebral. And Jackson was their apprentice. And after one year, age 18, the cerebral fellow said, go get a year of book learning. So J Jackson went across the state of New York, transferred in effect into the Albany Law School, and completed its two-year program. But he was only 20, too young to join the New York State Bar, 
needed three years of law preparation, so he returned to Jamestown and was an apprentice for an additional year. And then at age 21, if you get started early, you can do a lot, he became a lawyer. And over the course of the next 20 years, he practiced in Jamestown as a solo and then gradually building a practice and impressing people. Then he got recruited to Buffalo, the nation's 10th largest city, and did high stakes, high value commercial litigation. Then he returned to Jamestown, figuring he could climb to be the man at the top of the ladder faster there, and he was completely right. In short order, he's arguing cases in the New York Court of Appeals and impressing the chief judge, Benjamin Cardozo, who sponsors him for membership in the American Law Institute. He's the head of the local bar, and then the head of the regional bar, and then a rising figure in the oil and gas section and other parts of the American Bar Association. By 1930, he's an officer. By 1932, he's the head of the American Bar Association House of Delegates. He has a prosperous practice despite the Depression, real clients, real business, real income, real assets, and so no wipeout happens to Robert Jackson. Instead, he's living happily in a house with a beautiful wife, two beautiful children, a large series of white pillars, plus an 88-acre horse farm, a cabin cruiser on Chautauqua Lake. He has life by the tail. He's also a Democrat by heredity, by Jeffersonian, Andrew Jacksonian, rural democracy. And early, early, when he was about 18, he'd been introduced on a trip to Albany when he was a law apprentice to a young state senator, Frank Roosevelt. Nice name, but you know, he's never gonna amount to anything. His cousin, the Colonel, that's a Roosevelt. But of course, that 28-year-old became Franklin, and that 18-year-old became Robert Jackson of legal significance in Western New York. And when Franklin Roosevelt is returning from polio to the political scene in 1928, Jackson becomes involved in New York State democracy, which becomes the governorship, which becomes the president-elect and becomes a path to Washington. Over the next seven years, Jackson rises through an incredible trajectory of positions. 1934, the number, Rod, is five. Five presidential appointments and senatorial confirmations. Although by today's standards, he held seven jobs that today would require a presidential nomination and a senatorial confirmation. He is appointed and confirmed first as general counsel of the Revenue Bureau in the Treasury Department, today the IRS. And then he's detailed in 1935 to the SEC, which then was done by presidential order, but today would be an appointment. Then in 1936, he's appointed and confirmed by the Senate to be an assistant attorney general, heading the tax division. Then a year later, he's transferred over, today it would be a separate appointment, to head the antitrust division. And of course, we will return to that year. In 1938, he's appointed Solicitor General of the United States and serves in that office for two years. And then in 1940, he is appointed Attorney General of the United States and serves in this office for 18 months. And then in 1941, in the summer, he's appointed an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. He's 49 years old. Across that trajectory, uh, all of it mattered deeply to Robert Jackson, but we're not done. Because as a justice, he's developing the Justice Jackson reputation and writing the works in those first four years that we know, his opinion for the court in Barnett, his dissent in Korematsu, his concurring opinion in Edwards and many others. And the expectation is as the American leading legal figure, when Chief Justice Harlan Stone, an aging figure, is ready to leave the center seat, FDR will make Robert Jackson the Chief Justice of the United States. Of course, Harlan Stone outlived Franklin Roosevelt. And shortly thereafter, Harry Truman, the new accidental president, has a heck of a legal problem and needs a great lawyer. You see, we're about to win the war in Europe, and we have committed with our allies that once the victory is won, we together will hold accountable the Nazi perpetrators for this activity, which is war, which is crime against the international order. And so Harry Truman recruits Robert Jackson in April of 1945 to be what becomes the chief U.S. prosecutor at Nuremberg. The pitch is that the job is ready to go, kind of a turnkey operation, summer recess of the court, no big deal. It, of course, turns into Nuremberg, a very big, complicated deal, first diplomatic and then trial work. And Jackson misses an entire year at the Supreme Court, leaving a court of eight for the 1945 term. Then he returns from Nuremberg to the court in the fall of 1946 and lives for eight more years. So there's 13 years of judicial service, 12 actually in Washington on the bench deciding cases. And then shortly after, he's part of the unanimous nine in Brown versus Board of Education. 
He succumbs to a heart attack in October of 1954. He's gone, except for all of our purposes and the eternal significance he has, at only age 62. That's the life of Robert Jackson. Let me turn to Robert Jackson's year as the Assistant Attorney General heading the Antitrust Division. I must say, wishing to be a good guest but wishing to be a historian, that the Antitrust Division was really, as I think of it, more of a platform for Jackson as a new dealer than a particular practice specialty in which Jackson was prepared, well-suited, and designed to flourish. You see, the Antitrust Division was a high-profile position dealing with the economy, and that, of course, was the priority of the New Deal. So the rising Jackson and the New Deal economic program meant putting this AAG of the Tax Division, and no insult to it, over into the Antitrust Division. Franklin Roosevelt, in early 1937, about to be inaugurated for his second term, is actually thinking about Jackson for bigger and other things. Perhaps chairman of the SEC, because Jim Landis is about to go to be the dean of Harvard Law School, or perhaps, since FDR is about to, he believes, enlarge the Supreme Court, to make Robert Jackson a U.S. Supreme Court justice in 1937. Attorney General Homer Cummings, who lived a little uncomfortably with the supernova of Jackson as one of his underlings, talked the president into giving Jackson the appointment to head the Antitrust Division. As AAG in the Antitrust Division, Jackson ran a small division by today's standards, and he was involved in all of its major cases. It included an aggressive nationwide prosecution of oil companies for price fixing. It included criminal grand jury investigations of auto loan tying practices, which became a national controversy. It included the resumption of the prosecution, begun presidencies in the past, of the Aluminum Company of America, Alcoa. And it included the work on antitrust law reform proposals, which were internal DOJ matters and then legislative and public discussions. It also involved much else. You see, the New Deal and politics, both national and personal, were at the heart of Robert H. Jackson's year, 1937, in this division. And bear with me as I review two chronologies. The first is Robert Jackson's travels, all of which are for major, publicized, printed, and many on national radio broadcast speeches during the year when he's heading the antitrust division. January 21. New York City to speak to the New York State Bar. February 5th, New York and then Philadelphia. February 17th, Jamestown and Mayville, New York, the county seat of Chautauqua County, his native region, uh, to do a private practice jury trial, which was a continuing piece of his private practice. Somehow that was permitted at the time. And that case was a small anti-monopolization effort, if you will, where his client, the Jamestown Telephone Company, was in court fighting Ma Bell and the Jamestown Telco flourished. March 4th, Rochester, New York. March 16th, New York City to argue before the Second Circuit in the Social Security old age case. We'll return to that matter. March 17th, Boston, by Washington, by plane. From Washington, by plane, a rarity in the day. Most were the, of these were train trips. March 24th, New York City to speak at the Astor Hotel and debate at the Economic Club in the afternoon and then to speak in Carnegie Hall that evening at a Labor Party rally. March 25th, back to Jamestown in a big statewide bar meeting. March 29th, here in Washington, back to be at the Supreme Court for what was called White Monday, the court announcing its decision in West Coast Hotel versus Parrish, which is really the break of the nine old men and the success of the New Deal beginning in the Supreme Court. But then Jackson's back on the road, April 12th. He's, uh, I'm sorry, May 13th, he's back in New York to discuss possible grand jury prosecutions of unions for Sherman Act violations. May 15th, Jamestown for law practice, again on the private side, and to do horse farm repairs. May 26th, Atlanta and then Sea Island, Georgia to speak to the Georgia Bar. June 8th, Warren, Pennsylvania, and then Jamestown and time on his cabin cruiser. July 9th, escorting the Solicitor General Stanley Reed to speak at Chautauqua Institution. August 24th, to speak in Jamestown to the New York State Federation of Labor Convention. 
September 17th to give a major speech in New York City, which the Assistant Attorney General has quoted a number of times, to the Trade and Commerce Bar Association and the Trade Association executives, a heavy platform of antitrust speaking. September 25th, the New York State Bar meeting in Niagara Falls. October 6th, New York City to argue again before the Second Circuit in the electric bond and share case, to which I will return. October 12th, Chapel Hill. November 2nd, Jamestown to vote. November 27th, Atlantic City to speak to educators. In late November, to go fishing off the coast of Florida with President Roosevelt and to plot everything, including law and politics. December 11th, New York City. December 13th, Chicago. December 15th, Jamestown. December 29th, Philadelphia. And in many of these gaps, major speeches in Washington. And then in early 1938, as the move from antitrust to solicitor general is taking shape, Jackson debates Wendell Wilkie on the town hall of the air at Town Hall of New York, Wilkie being the head of a major holding company and, if you will, a force of economic power at war with the New Deal. January 8th, New York City. January 15th, Rochester. January 21 uh, and January 26th, both Boston, then Syracuse, then the start of his confirmation hearing. And in the middle of that, despite being a contested nominee for Solicitor General, three more speeches in New York City before February is done. And that's not all he did with that year give and take, because Jackson also was arguing cases in the Supreme Court. In other words, he was leaning into a bit his next job, Solicitor General. April 2nd, 1937, the case about the coconut oil tax, Cincinnati soap, which you don't recall properly. But you do recall this, April 9th, Seward Machine versus Davis, the Social Security unemployment tax. And May 5th, Helvering versus Davis, the Social Security old age pension tax, both of which were wins before May was done. In the next term, October 18th, an FTC statutory case called Standard Education. October 22nd, two taxation cases involving stock dividends. November 8th and 9th, a two-day argument in the Alcoa case about the injunctive power of the Federal District Court in Pittsburgh. And during his confirmation hearing in February 1938, while he's still heading the Antitrust Division, defending the constitutionality of the Public Utility Holding Company Act in electric bond and share, the case that months earlier he had argued in the Second Circuit. Now, in addition to each of those things, Robert Jackson was also doing antitrust law. And let me say a few words about that. First, Jackson uh, wasn't an expert. We need to be candid about that. Uh, he had tried against the United States in Chicago one major antitrust case in the 1920s involving uh, price fixing by furniture manufacturers, and it went to trial, and Jamestown furniture manufacturers, his clients and others, were found to have conspired in violation of the Sherman Act, and they were fined a nominal amount. But that was about it. What he was was a New Deal lawyer in this 1937 moment that was post-National Industrial Recovery Act, post Blue Eagle, post NRA, post voluntary cooperative arrangements among businesses, struck down by the Supreme Court in Schechter Poultry, and a new deal moving back into the realm of enforcement of the antitrust laws. The target was monopoly. And in Jackson's speeches and in Jackson's time, I have to say that is quite a loose and encompassing concept. It includes, I'd say, anti-anti-new dealers particularly in the business community. It included anti-forces leading to a double-dip recession in late 1937. It included, yes, as the Assistant Attorney General has emphasized, pro-use of economics in government business lawyering and the work of the Antitrust Division. And you see a tale of that just a few years later in Jackson's opinion for the unanimous court in Wickard versus Filburn about the power that Congress has under, under the Commerce Clause and the nature of demand in the interstate market. And for Jackson, the antitrust work in 1937 was anti-complexity, pro-common sense, and pro-consumer and pro-small business. You see this in two places that I'll highlight before I finish. First is a little speech he gave in November of 1937. It was to a group called the Cooperative Forum. It met at 1110 F Street, which is today either a potbelly sandwich or Arnold and Porter or some combination thereof. And Jackson was speaking to a Democratic audience, but the text was publicly released, about what things should be kept in mind as we think of antitrust work. Four simple points. 
First, enforcement is not hostility to business. Monopoly prosecutions are conflicts between just two types of businesses, big trying to crush small. And so antitrust work is pro-business by definition. Second, monopoly is not only a problem of prosperity. Even in times of national recovery flagging or a return of recession, monopoly is a problem that the government needs to address. Third, enforcement is not an effort to increase government control of the economy. Indeed, enforcement is an alternative to more pervasive government control of the economy. We get this right here in the department, and we avoid centralization and standardization of the NIRA variety or something more centralized. And therefore, fourth, it is in the interest of business to aid and improve our antitrust law and its enforcement. We are in this together, is what Jackson's message was. He also made this clear in a context that circles back to his own background. In the September 17 Constitution Day speech he gave at the Astor in New York City, he tied anti-monopoly work into the small virtues of towns like Jamestown and businesses like furniture manufacturing and the independence of the American economy. This is a paragraph of Jackson. Our solution of the anti-monopoly problems must be in terms of our ideals, the ideal of political and economic democracy. We want no economic or political dictatorship imposed upon us, either by the government or by big business. We want no system of detailed regulation of prices by the government, nor price fixing by private interests. We do not want bureaucracy or regimentation of any kind, but we will prefer government to private bureaucracy and regimentation if we are to have to make a choice. We cannot permit private co corporations to become private governments. We must keep our economic system under the control of the people who live by and under it. In the words of the President in his second inaugural address, we must find practical controls over blind economic forces and blindly selfish men. Thus I conclude by circling back. First to John Nash. A friend once asked him if he had seen a beautiful mind. And Professor Nash replied, yes, two and a half times. I love that line. It's about precision. It's about candor. It's about individuality. And my limited knowledge of Dr. Nash in that anecdote connects with my deeper knowledge of Robert Jackson across the many topics, because Jackson was those things, precision, candor, and individuality, including in his antitrust thinking, including his AAG running this division, and including across his life. I'll close by reflecting again on what it means to be in this room. But another moment in 1940 is the one that comes to mind now. It preceded by about two months the federal prosecutor's speech of April 1, 1940. Late January 1940, Solicitor General Jackson had been appointed and confirmed and now commissioned to be the Attorney General of the United States. That happened at the White House. That's the stroke of the presidential pen. The department had been through a tough year in 1939. The Deputy Attorney General alluded to this. There were leadership problems, and this was a demoralized building. But the building knew Robert Jackson, and now it was somewhat ecstatic to have him at the helm. Jackson came from the White House back to DOJ, and he was steered into this room, I think probably through those curtains and down those few steps. And as he stepped into the Great Hall, he found that there was a large floral horseshoe standing on the stage that he walked through. And that was a gift and a token from the employees of the Department of Justice to greet him and to celebrate their good luck that he was now their boss. I think, of course, it's a biographer's argument, but I have material, that it was great fortune for this country and this world and this department to have Robert Jackson in all the many capacities. It's great fortune today to have, when it's led wisely to pursue its legal responsibilities without improper motivations, this Department of Justice. And if I had a garland of flowers, I assure you, I would loop it with thanks and very best wishes around the person of each of you here today. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Barrett. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor George Akerlof of the University of California at Berkeley. Professor Akerlof received the Nobel Prize in Economics for his contributions to the theory of markets with asymmetric informa information. It all began with a paper published in 1970 called The Market for Lemons. The fundamental insight of that paper is that markets may not work so well when buyers aren't sure what they are getting and sellers aren't able to credibly signal quality. Professor Akerlof developed his model in the market for used cars, but it never was a paper about used cars. Rather, it was about every market where informational problems arise and the institutions that emerge to deal with them. Professor Akerlof uses his model to explain how Medicare solves informational problems in health insurance markets, why tourists flock to restaurant chains, and the existence of lifetime guarantees on merchandise. But the list is practically endless. In Professor Akerlof's 2001 Nobel lecture, he describes his market for lemons paper as, quote, the first application of a new economic orientation in which models are constructed with careful attention to realistic microeconomic detail. That line struck me because it is precisely what we endeavor to do here at the Antitrust Division every day when we analyze markets. Fortunately, thanks to the pioneering work of Professor Akerlof and others, we have a rich set of theoretical tools at our disposal. Professor Akerlof. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, so I wanna thank everybody for asking me to give the Jackson Nash, uh, let's, let's see whether I can. Let's see what happens. There we are. The Jackson Nash address. I'm tremendously honored to be invited to the Department of Justice. And I'm especially honored because you, my audience, are my heroes. You work selfishly, tirelessly, and fairly to serve the public interest. And as you all know, your work is tremendously important. So today, I'm going to talk about a book I've written with Robert Schiller. Uh, it's called Fishing for Fools, and let me give you some prefatory notes on that. Okay, first of all. Um, okay, the first and fundamental motivation of this book is to challenge the view of the public and economist that whatever markets do is right. Such belief that whatever markets do is right has the further problem is it's enshrined in morality that greed is healthy, to quote Ivan Bosky. Of course, all of us would take into account income distribution and such things as pollution, but that does not exhaust the reasons why competitive markets yield bad outcomes. Contrary to free to choose thinking, our book shows that there's not only a good side to free markets, there's also a very serious downside. It explores the notion that markets are the playing field, the playing field for deception and manipulation because they spawn what we call fishing for fools. Now, all economists know this. Everybody in this audience knows this. But that leads to the second very general motivation. The rule of what can and what cannot be published in economics leaves holes. There's some perfectly valid and important things to say, but there's no way to say them that would be acceptable in any journal. For example, quite a few economists thought that financial derivatives would lead to something like the financial crisis of 2008. But economists could not figure out a way to express these views in the form of a paper. So I believe that fishing for fool is one of those holes in economics because we all know it, because you know it, and I know it. Because we all know it, it cannot be published, and then because it cannot be published in journal form, it gets ignored. And because it was ignored, we had the financial crisis, which is the central event in the economic history of our times. But then, the book also has a subtext, which gradually becomes increasingly important as the book proceeds. I think that this sub subtext leads to a rather different view of how to use economic thinking, and I will come to that later. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me back there? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. okay. So let me give, begin with the theory. 
Danny's observation. The book is based on conversations with the psychologist Danny Kahneman some 30 years ago. In a conversation then, Danny told me that the basis for psychology is that we humans are machines. We humans are machines that are prone to error. The job of the psychologist then is to figure out that error. In contrast, he said, the basic fundamental notion of economics is equilibrium. That equilibrium means that if there's a profit left on the table, someone will take up that opportunity for profit. You see that every time you go to the supermarket. People sequentially choose what they think is the shortest line, and in equilibrium, the lines are almost the same length. And I see that every time I go to the supermarket. Which line should I choose? It's hard to make that choice. That's the point. So how to put Danny's insight into economics? Danny's insight says that free markets will not just provide what we really want. That's only the case if we human machines are making the right choices. But free markets will also provide us with the wrong choices. They will do so as long as there's a profit to be made. To restate, the principle means that if we have some weakness or other in the equilibrium, that weakness will be taken up if there's a profit to be made. That means that, means that among business persons looking around and deciding where to spend their money, some will look to see if there are unusual profits from our weaknesses. And if they see such pro opportunity for profit, that will be what they choose. As a result, economies will have a fishing equilibrium. That's an equilibrium in which every chance for profit more than the ordinary will be taken up. And that includes our willingness to make the wrong choices. So example one is cinnamon. Okay? So, the motto is, life needs frosting. That may be true, life may need frosting, but does it really need all of that much of it? <laughs> so all those sales of Cinnabons are a natural result of a free market equilibrium. Second example comes from a metaphor, metaphor invented by Bob. Keith Chen, Venkat Lakshmi Narayanan, and Laurie Santos taught capuchin monkeys how to use money to trade. The monkeys developed an appreciation of price. They saved and they did other transactions. But let's go beyond the experiments. Let's do a thought experiment. Suppose, just suppose we opened up the monkeys to trading with humans quite generally. We would give a large population of capuchins substantial incomes and let them be customers of for-profit businesses run by humans without regulatory safeguard. Well, you can easily imagine that the free market system, with its taste for profits, would supply whatever the mon monkeys choose to buy. We would expect an equal economic equilibrium with concoctions appealing to strange capuchin tastes. But amid this monkey cornucopia, their choices would be very different from what makes them happy. How do we know? We know from Chen, Lakshmi Narayanan, and Santos that they love free fruit roll-up tacos with marshmallow fluff. Okay. So capuchins have limited ability to resist temptations, and we have every expectation that they would become anxious, malnourished, exhausted, addicted, quarrelsome, and sickened. We know that's Bob's line. OK, so two types of tastes. We now come to the point of this thought experiment. We shall see what it has to say about humans. Our view of the monkeys as analyzable behavior is that they have two types of what economists call tastes. First type of tastes are what the capuchins would exercise if they made the decisions that are good for them. Second type of taste, the second type of taste, their fruit roll-up taco taste are those they actually exercise. Now, humans are no doubt smarter than monkeys but we can view our behavior in the same terms. We can imagine us humans, like the capuchins, as also having two different types of taste. The first concept of taste describes what's good for us, what's really good for us, but as in the case of the capuchins, that's, all, that's not always the basis for all of our decisions. The second concept of taste is the taste that determine how we really make our choices, and those choices may not, in fact, be good for us. So the distinction between the two types of taste and the example that capuchins gives us an image. 
We can think about our economy as if we all have monkeys on our shoulders when we go shopping and when we make our economic decisions. But those monkeys on our shoulders are in the form of the weaknesses, the weaknesses that have been exploited by marketers for ages. Because of those weaknesses, many of our choices differ from what we really want, or alternatively stated, differ from what's good for us. So we're not generally aware of that monkey on our shoulder. So in the absence of some curbs on markets, we reach an economic equilibrium, an economic equilibrium where the monkeys on the shoulder are substantially causing, causing, calling the shots. So this now takes us to a further proposition, a further proposition. The modern rendition of Adam Smith's invisible hand statement is, as you probably all know, a competitive, uh, that a competitive free market equilibrium is Pareto optimal. What does that mean? That means that once such an economy is in equilibrium, it's impossible to improve the economic welfare of everyone. For example, a chain that would cause my welfare would go up would cause your welfare or someone else's, perhaps Jeff's, to go down. Any interference will make someone worse off. The theory, of course, recognizes some factors that might blemish such an equilibrium of competitive free markets, such as pollution and bad distributions of income. But with these qualifications, with those qualifications, the result is believed by economists to be true. But then, with completely free markets, there's not only freedom to choose, there's also freedom to fish. There will, it will still be true that the equilibrium will be Pareto optimal, but be an equilibrium that's optimal in terms of what we really want, not in terms of what we really want, it will be an equilibrium that's optimal instead in terms of those monkey on our shoulder tastes. Now, standard economics has ignored this obvious difference because most economists, most economists think for the most part, people do know what they want. So that means that there's nothing much to be gained from examining the differences between what we really want and those monkey on the shoulder tastes. But that, that ignores the field of psychology. The field of psychology is mainly about the consequences of those terrible monkeys. It also ignores that in competitive equilibrium, people will also generate information to lead others astray insofar as there's a profit to be made. So that ignores that markets enable fishing for fools. So, onus on us. The onus on Bob and myself in the book is then to indicate that in real life, fishing for fools does affect our life. So we see there are four areas of nobody could possibly want. In all of these, we are seriously fish for fools. So personal financial uh, insecurity, area one. Fundamental fact of economic life has never made it into the economics textbooks. Most adults, most adults, even in rich countries, go to bed at night worried about how to pay the bills. Economists think that it's easy for people to spend according to a budget. We shall see later that it isn't. No one wants to go to bed at night worried about the bills, yet most people do. Area two of nobody uh, could possibly want financial and macroeconomic instability. Fishing for fools in financial markets is the leading cause of financial crises. Every time it is different, the stories are different, the entrepreneurs are different, their offerings are different, but also every time it is the same. There are the fishermen and there are the fools. When the build up stock of undiscovered fishes named the bezel by John Kenneth Balraith gets discovered, asset prices crash. The last crisis, the investors who ended up with the overrated securities could not have possibly wanted them. Okay. Area three of nobody could possibly want is ill health. Here we discuss how the pharmaceuticals do their fishing with a pH and how the food industry, again with a pH, fills us with sugar, salt, and fat. In his five-year career, Vioxx is estimated to have caused 26,000 to 56,000 cardiovascular deaths in the U.S. No one wants bad medicine. According to the CDC, 39.8% of American adults are obese. That's up 
more than 4% from what it was just a few years ago, something like five years ago, which is the last time I visited that number. No one wants to be a booth beast. Then there's tobacco, which I'm not going to even talk about. Area four of nobody could possibly want is bad government. Just as free markets work tolerably well under ideal conditions, so does democracy. But politics is vulnerable. It's vulnerable to the simplest fish. Politicians silently gather money from the interest and use that money to show they are just one of the folks, one of the folks back home. OK, so I'm going to give you a taste of one of the chapters, OK? And then I'm going to draw some lessons, OK? Taste of one of the chapters, OK? OK. So probably most of you have seen Susie Orman. Okay. She gives, as you know, very loud and shrill financial advice. Her audience seems to lap up her every word. When I asked an IMF economist friend of mine about her, Gill had the predictable reaction. He could not stand her mommy knows this voice. And he found her investment advice simplistic. But that does not explain why Orman's audiences are there lapping her up. Her most popular book is The Nine Steps to Financial Freedom, Practical and Spiritual a Step So You Can Stop Worrying. Let's contrast what she tells us there with the portrait of consumer spending in the economics textbooks. According to economics textbooks, we decide on our demand for the proverbial apples and oranges by choosing the bundles of apples and oranges that maximize our happiness subject to our budget constraint. But Susie Orman's financial advice books tell us that consumers do not follow. They do not follow such a textbook protocol in their purchases. So how could consumers do anything other than what the textbooks describe? So I'm an economist, and I, you know, I can't imagine anything. They do anything different. But she tells us that people have emotional hang-ups with regard to spending money, and they are not honest with themselves. And as a consequence, they do not engage in rational budgeting. Well, how should, could, could she know? Well, she's a financial advisor, and she is a test. She asked her advisees to seriously add up their expenditures and then those expenditures all but invariably sh fall short of what a documented accounting from the records later turns up. Figuratively, figuratively relative to the proverbial trip to the supermarket to buy apples and oranges, it's as if her advisees spend too much time in the fruit section. By the time they reach dairy products, there's nothing left over for eggs and milk. In real life, such budgetary failure translates into having nothing left over for savings. That corresponds, of course, to the fact that in poor areas of town, uh, there's a rush on milk and eggs at the beginning of the month. Okay. It's her mission, it's Orman's mission then, to keep those bills down so her readers and her clients will no longer worry at night. That's the role of mommy, and it's also why those audiences are excusing that mommy knows best voice. So it's worse. Worth noting, more than parenthetically, that worries, as noted in Orman's subtitle, are central concerns of the financial advice books, but you do not find them in books on economics. Okay. So we can paint a statistical portrait which shows that this is a con serious concern. Okay. So this poses a problem. The Susie Orman view of the world suggests that people are spending too much and they're worried as a result. That leads to the question, why? And this takes us to the second general message from Fishing for Fools. And now I'm going to turn to that. Current behavioral economics is based on economics and on psychology. But there's a new emerging branch of economics, and that's based on sociology rather than psychology. So why should sociology make a difference? So think about what the sociologists do. As we've already seen, the textbooks, the economics textbooks, tells that we should describe our behavior in the supermarket as maximizing our utility subject to a budget constraint. You know all that stuff. So that's what determines our demand for apples and oranges. According to the textbooks, that's the story that we're telling ourselves. The textbooks also indicate that we should use a similar story going forward to drive most of economics. Perhaps surprisingly, such derivation just fails to describe much of real life. So the question arises, what's the mistake in the model? Basic mistake uh, is that our economic models rein in on people 
our assumptions regarding what they care about and then corresponding how they behave. So they rain in from 30,000 people for us, 30,000 feet on us poor people down below. They tell us how we're behaving. Well, so people may be very purposeful, as economists presume. That means we're maximizing something. But how people behave is determined by how they think. And a good way to picture how people think and what determines how people behave is that in every moment of our lives, we're living out some story. The decisions that we make depend on the stories that are our focus when we make our, those decisions. Well, the first part of the book refers to conventional behavioral economics regarding why people may be fooled. The second part of the book emphasizes this much more general point. That point is that we're fooled because we're always telling ourselves stories. Now, just think about this session here today where we talk about Robert Jackson. That was telling stories. And there's stories ab around this building in abundance about what, about what the meaning is of the Department of Justice. This telling of stories corresponds to the core of both sociology and cultural anthropology. That core is ethnographies that uncover those stories that people are telling themselves. It also reflects what advertisers do. So advertisers' mission is to graft onto the story that we're already telling ourselves another story that will get us to buy their product. So in order to make our story economics right, we need to base motivation on those stories that people are telling themselves. So, before I go further, let me give you an indication of the ubiquity of stories in any capitalist economy. You see it on any commercial street in any town. The shop windows are there to induce you to tell yourself a story that gets you to come in and buy. So I'm going to tell you a little story about this. In the US, in the old days, some of us are old enough to remember that, you know, in suburban areas, there used to be pet stores that placed puppies in the window. And there's an old song. So Patty Page, the singer, is coming down the street, and she sees such a puppy, and she sings the following. I hope you don't mind if I sing, OK? I'm going to sing. So how much is that dog in the window, the one with the waggly tail? How much is that dog in the window? Arf, arf. I do hope that doggie's for sale. Well, some people know that first word. But I'll bet you there are very few people in the audience who know the next. What does the next say? Next say, uh, I must take a trip to California and leave my poor sweetheart alone. If he has a dog, he won't be lonesome, and the doggy will have a good home. So I don't know if it was intentional, but this song has a beautiful ambiguity that exactly mirrors fishing for fools. On the one hand, the girl's purchase may be marvelously considerate. Her relationship with her boyfriend may be perfect. Every time the doggy wags its tail, the boyfriend will be reminded of their beautiful romance. On the other hand, think about it, the relationship may be a disaster. The girl may be scatterbrained, and every time the doggy needs to be walked, the boyfriend will have to take care of it, and he will also be reminded of the failed relationship. So life in a capitalist economy is therefore not just an opportunity to get what you want, it's also about the creation and spread of stories that influence you to come and, in and buy. The stories are to get you to buy, irrespective of whether the purchase is good for you or not. Okay. So most of the rest of the talk now will be four stories that indicate their central role in economics and politics. So let me give you the first of these, the euro. How did the Europeans get themselves into uh, the euro? So there's a fantastic new book on the origins of the European Monetary Union by Ashoka Modi. Its title is Euro Tragedy. There was a story, there was a story that Europeans' desire for unity would allow them to easily overcome the problems of a fixed exchange rate across most of Europe. Helmut Kohl had told a similar story in Germany in the late 1980s and early 1990s regarding the currency union of East and West Germany at a one-to-one -one ratio between Eastmarks and Deutschmarks. And then Kohl became a leading supporter of the euro. 
The integration of the East German and West German economies had been difficult enough, but, but with the Euro, no single language would e ease migration as had occurred between the two Germanys, nor would they, there be huge fiscal transfers from richer countries to poor countries to ease any problems. So economists' analysis that a single currency would prevent needed exchange rate adjustments went unheeded, and the story of the benefits from the euro gained traction. So Modi tells how the myth, the myth of the benefits of the euro, escaped like a virus from official meetings. Part of that story was simply magical thinking, that the problems of a fixed exchange rate would be magically solved with the wave of a desire for unity, magic wand. The story itself has played a crucial role in the economic state of Europe today. Let me tell you a second story, okay. bread and bullets. Another example of a story comes from a paper by Dennis Snower and myself entitled Bread and Bullets. It begins with a joke from communist Russia. Man walks into a grocery store with a notebook. Do you have sausage? No. Nope. He makes a note. Bread? No. Nope. Makes another note. 20 years ago, they would have shot you for making notes like that, says a woman waiting in line. No bullets either, he writes. So the joke illustrates the Soviet system at every scale. So our article demonstrates the role of the Bolshevik story under the communists. According to that story, the Bolshevik plan for force-fed industrialization would create a new paradise on Earth. That story legitimated extreme cruelty against anyone accusing, accused of resisting the plan. But even worse, even worse, ruthless men like Stalin falsely accused their opponents of resistance to the plan. And then they used the sanctions legitimated by the Bolshevik story to eliminate those opponents. Let me give you another story. Global war. First inconvenient story of global warming is the physical problem of climate change itself. But there's also a second inconvenient truth. Those are the stories that the public tells itself. At the extreme, those stories say that global warming is a hoax. Yet more prevalent is failure to perceive the urgency of counteracting it. Year after year after year slips by, and the threat gets even, ever worse. OK, so let's uh, turn to another story. And I'm going to talk at some length about this extra story. But I should say that as a macroeconomist, which is what I do for a living, this is the story for which I feel personally responsible, and this is the one that keeps me personally awake at night. OK? Uh, okay. Let's see what we have here. No, I, I'm, I'm a little bit ahead of it. OK, here we are, financial derivatives. The 1990s, financial derivatives of many different complicated types were introduced, and they grew wildly. Economists said that the new securities were benign. They would just enable people to hedge against risk. Based on this re reasoning, the US Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000 greatly restricted the res regulation of financial derivatives. The logic of this deregulation failed to see that financial markets serve two functions. They match savers with investors. That's good. But financial markets are also a gambling casino, and thus they're also a way to bilk the unwary. That's bad. The spread of these derivatives then greatly increased the ability of, to use financial markets as a gambling casino. The securities can be designed to dupe people into bad investments, and then people go bust. In the Sander interpretation of 2008, Markets for derivative mortgage-backed securities were a playing field to fish people for fools. And they played a central role in the financial crisis of 2008. How this happened is told in the Financial Crisis Inquiry Report, and similarly it's retold in Fishing for Fools. Now, I see serious consequences for today, okay? And I want to talk about that. I have been hearing and I have been seeing, as an economist, in the newspapers, a crescendo of stories about overextension of credit. Underlying these stories is concern 
about a repeat financial crisis. Now, this has implications for policy. There is an erroneous view that financial crises occur only because of moral hazard. That is, they, they occur because people take on undue risks, only because they're confident that the government will bail them out in the event of bankruptcy. Based on such views, Dodd-Frank greatly restricted the ability of the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and the FDIC to intervene in the event of a financial crash such as occurred in 2008. But on the contrary, as described in our book, the 2008 financial crash did not occur because of moral hazard. It occurred because of fishing for fools. People were telling themselves the wrong stories. Those wrong stories were then accompanied by profits for those who were able to take advantage of them. Those immediate profits, those profits that people were, were pocketing right at the moment were so juicy that the possibilities of bailout later were at most a very marginal consideration. What does that mean? That means that the restrictions on the Fed, the Treasury, and the FDIC to intervene in financial markets will not prevent such crashes from occurring. Not only do the regulators need additional powers to reduce the chances that they occur, but also if and when such crashes do occur, the emergency interventions such as occurred in 2008, they at least need the powers that were taken away. So just two weeks ago, if you read the New York Times very carefully, Ben Bernanke, Tim Geithner, and Hank Paulson published an opinion piece in the New York Times. So they made a plea for at least the restoration of the powers that kept the 2008 crisis from turning into a repeat of the Great Depression. But beyond this strict particular message, in the absence of strict regulation, the inventiveness of financial markets tells us that such crashes are no accident. They are highly likely to occur. Perhaps they are even an inevitability, as people in financial markets find ways to make profits from those who are telling themselves and acting on wrong stories. OK, so let me come to a summary and conclusion. So thank you for listening to all this. The book, Fishing for Fools, then gives us two major points. The Pareto optimality of competitive markets is not the Pareto optimality of our what's good for you taste. It's the Pareto optimality of our monkey on the shoulder taste. That means if you have some weakness from which someone can make a profit, that someone somewhere will find it profitable to set up a business to take advantage of your weakness. That's what happens in a fishing equilibrium. So fishing for fools gives example after example after example of this principle. It teaches us that the world's problems are not just fundamental physical problems like global warming itself. They also include the stories that people tell themselves that get us into physical problems. Such stories also keep us from dealing with those problems effectively when they arise. So those stories and how they arise should be a part of our economics itself. As illustrations of the roles of this story, we saw the euro, we saw communism, we saw global warming, we saw financial derivatives, and then we saw the doggy. So counteracting stories that lead to bad outcomes needs to be a major job for economists. So finally, just let me repeat the example I gave because I think it's of current importance. Finally, I spoke briefly about financial crashes. They occur mainly because of the stories people tell themselves and the profits to be made because of those stories. That means that they're highly likely even in the absence of prospective government bailouts. Fishing for fools underlies the roots of most financial panics. And to prevent those panics, policymakers need broad regulatory authority to prevent them. But when such regulations fail and financial crises do occur, the policymakers also need powers that are considerably expanded from current law. So thank you very much. Thank you. Time for questions, yes. Oh, oh, we have time. I don't know what time it is, actually. Uh, oh, okay. Why don't I take one question? Does anybody have a question? <laughs>
Okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay. okay. I think you well intimidated them with the questions. Um, if, if some of you have not read the paper, The Market for Lemons, which Dr. Akerlof wrote um, and was recognized for, uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, paper with lots of relevance, but what a great treat and what a great privilege and honor for me uh, to be able to even stand on the stage, not only with uh, Noel and Rod, who had to leave, but to get a great history lesson of one of my personal heroes uh, from Professor uh, Barrett, and also to get this great economic lesson about, especially on this 10-year anniversary of the, of the financial crash uh, from Professor Akerlof. So thank you both uh, for being present today. Um, I got to say, the Nobel Prize is nothing. I think I'm going to nominate you for the Grammys with that song that you had there. <laughs> if I could, uh, we have uh, Professor Akerlof on behalf of the Department of Justice. And what a great way to honor the contributions of Professor Nash to the field of economics. And Professor Baird, if I could, uh, if you would like to mention this on behalf of the division. Thank you for coming here to give us a great history lesson. Most important thing I learned today was how many speeches Robert Jackson gave as the head of the antitrust division. <laughs> I keep on hearing that I've been speaking a little bit too much. I, I think I've got to pick up the pace now and travel. Uh, if you guys uh, would like, please stay There's for minor refreshments and a reception here in the honor of our guests today. Thank you again to Justice Jackson's uh, grandchildren, and uh, for, for taking the time and being here, and all of you for coming here. I never thought we could uh, in any way beat the excitement that Professor Alvin Roth provided uh, when he pr presented the first one, but we had a double shot today, and thank you again.